So having looked at what these items are, right, real quick beforehand, I want to hand it over to y'all. I want to let you introduce what you do, you know, what the device you use is, all that good stuff. I'm going to let you have your full intro here. So I'm going to stop sharing and give you a sec to pull up whatever you need here. Um, hopefully it's fairly intuitive. Um, if yeah, you do the it. present, yeah, okay. And but Mond, you're going to share first. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, we were just going yeah, we to start off by interest. By interest. I'm, getting I'm getting some background. background. So I don't know if that's so coming from that's you, coming Shane. Shane. Um, here, let me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that helps. Oh, that helps. <laughs> I think we could hear. <laughs> I could hear myself. Um, so yeah, we were just going to start off talking about ourselves a little bit very briefly. Um, so I think we have till 10. Is that right? I think that's right okay perfect um so uh, and briefly introduce uh the rtnn which some of you may be familiar with but just to give you a heads up of what we are and what resources are available so um i'll introduce myself first my name is mod kachera i am currently the associate director of the rtnn um at, housed primarily at nc state but um as a partnership with unc and duke as well um i am an nc state grad um and biomedical engineering, yeah. So I graduated several years ago. I won't say quite when. Um, but so if anybody has questions about biomedical engineering or engineering programs in general at NC State, I'm happy to talk about that either the end of the presentation if there's time, which there might not be. But also if anybody has questions, they are welcome to email me um, or pop in if they, you know, once the campus is more open, which we are we are opening up more and more. Um, so uh, my my background but I'm biomedical engineering and then I went to graduate school at Rice University which is in Houston Texas um, and got my PhD in bioengineering as well with a focus on developing um, biomaterials uh, for tissue um, basically tissue engineering um, so I'm gonna let Philip introduce himself now yeah sure so uh, yeah I'm Philip uh, I'm also part of the research triangle nanotech network but located at NC State uh, I'm basically a staff scientist. Uh, I help operate a lot of instruments that are available in here that people need to do research or for companies to, to develop products, that kind of stuff. And one of them, and many of them includes electron microscopes, which is what I'm gonna be showing you today. Uh, uh, but yeah, so I also went to NC State. Uh, it's really the only option uh, if you want a good education. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I did textiles. Uh, if you don't know what textiles are, that's all fiber-based material. So the most obvious one that you're all wearing is clothes, but it goes so much further than clothes. There's, there's over a ton of textiles on any spaceship that goes up. Uh, it makes all kinds of things possible because it's very strong materials and lightweight. Uh, but yeah, that's all there is about me. There's lots more to learn, but of course, if you want to ask any questions about state or summer programs at state, let me know. Yeah, so uh, I'm briefly, briefly going to talk about what the RTNN is, um, and I alluded to that it's a partnership between NC State, Duke, and UNC, and it brings together our core facilities um, that are focused on doing nano work, but making things that are at the nanoscale and characterizing things at the nanoscale. So again, you're going to see one of the tools that we use to characterize things at that size scale um, with Philip. Um, and then we have a lot of educational opportunities um, for students to come see us. I know that a lot of times we have a, an event called Nano Days, which we didn't do this year because of COVID, but uh, we'll start up again next year. Um, we also have um, something that I just wanted to throw out there briefly was we have a program called our Kickstarter program that is provides free access to tools in our facilities. So if you ever have a project that you're working on um, and for school or just because you're interested and you want to use the SEM, um, we, have an, a, we have the ability to do that for free through the Kickstarter program. So um, if you're interested in that program, uh, just reach out to one, either Philip or I, and we can kind of give you some guidance. And you don't have to do it blindly. If you have an idea for something and you think um, and you think it'd be cool, um, we are happy to help kind of guide you in the application process. And it's very simple. It's about a paragraph. And we highly encourage projects from classrooms and students. So if, if that's something that you think you'd be interested in, oh, I see Philip drop the link in. Um, if you think that's something you'd be interested in, please reach out to, to one of us and I'll um, drop my email address in the chat and then I'll, I'm going to stay on and but I'm going to turn it over to Philip and I'll probably interject interject periodically. So. Yeah. Sure. 
All right, Over so, you, yeah, don't be scared of the Kickstarter thing. It's, I, I think we've had two or three high school students use it to, to get trained on these tools, just like the one you're going to see today. So um, there's all kinds of uses for it, but let's get to the fun stuff. So I am going to start sharing my screen in a moment. I'm going to just interrupt one more time, which is to say if anybody has questions, feel free to unmute yourself and shout them out during the presentation. Or if you feel more comfortable um, putting them in the chat, I can also take a look and then I'll, I'm happy to interrupt Philip. So, all right, go ahead, Philip. All right, yeah, so you should be able to see my screen, right? You see a slide with a picture of, a, of microscopes. Um, so, uh, so uh, I'm gonna quickly I'm gonna just go quickly through the background. background. I wanna get to the fun get stuff, the fun uh, stuff. But, uh, but just a quick question. Do you have a microscope in your room? I don't know, Shane, if you wanna answer on behalf of the students. I can't read the oh, yeah. chat while I'm looking at my screen. <laughs> Uh, they do, and, and they've used them throughout numerous classes as well. That is one of the, the skills that we build for them. Now, I know you're going to go through the differences in a second, but obviously we're using light microscopes for anything yeah. that we're doing yeah. here. Um, for AP Chemistry, if they take that class, we have a little more in-depth tools to use for stuff, but still nothing quite that's an electron microscope. Gotcha. Yeah, I, yeah. so that's what I'm getting at. Uh, when I was in middle school, high school, I we had microscopes. Uh, but they were only what we call and specifically referred to as light microscopes or optical microscopes. Uh, a microscope is any tool that you use to see something that's too small to see with your own eyes. So the one that's in your room, I'm going to take a wild guess, it probably has little binoculars that you look in, it shines a light on the sample, and then uh, it, it has different lenses which will magnify and condense or condense and then magnify that uh, that whatever you're looking at to be larger in life than it actually is so that you can see it with your own eye. Um, it may have a digital camera attached, uh, so it may not have binoculars depending on how fancy uh, your high school is. but. The microscope we're going to use today is also used to, to look at things that are too small to see with our own eyes, but the difference is it's an electron microscope. So take a wild guess. A light microscope uses light, an electron microscope uses electrons. Hopefully, uh, in high school, you've learned of electrons before. Uh, I'm going to just say, do you know what an electron is? I'm just going to imagine you're all shaking your heads. Or, nodding your heads, nodding saying, yes, you know where, you know where electrons come from, come but, from, but if you don't, if you just, don't to recap, just to recap, the, the electrons are part of an atom, you know, in the atom you have your protons and neutrons that are in the middle that make up its mass, and then you have electrons flying around that are negatively charged flying around the outside of the nucleus. Um, basically, we can harness electrons and create a beam. So imagine a laser, but instead of a laser, it's made of electrons. And the way we do that is kind of the same way an old, uh, an old school, what they call Edison bulb, uh, where you can see the filament in it in a light bulb, where you turn on the light and you can see the filament glowing. It's the same kind of concept, except the filament is in a V-shape. It's a tungsten filament, and we're using really, really high voltages. And it's basically getting so hot that the tungsten atoms are basically boiling off electrons. So we've got electrons flying around everywhere at the top of the microscope. We can't see them, and I'll get to that later. Uh, and then because they're negatively charged, what we can do is use a positively charged field using magnet lenses to accelerate those electrons to a sample. Now, when we do that, electrons travel at a wavelength smaller than particles of light can travel. And because they travel at a smaller wavelength, we can see even smaller things. Uh, uh, key thing is we can't see electrons, and uh, it would probably hurt our eyes if we had electrons flying around uh, because they generate x-rays and other things. But basically, we can't see them with our own eyes, so we have to actually use a special detector that can count electrons and then do some math and then generate an image using that. Uh, we're not going to go super into that, but I'm happy to answer any of those questions uh, if you have specific questions about it. We also have some helpful videos if you want to watch them. But the microscope we're going to be using today is, a, is pretty small. You would probably just think it's actually a big computer. This is a picture of it right here. So this is the desktop SEM. Um, if I could see myself, I would pull the camera up, but I want to make sure it stays on me. And I know I'm sharing my screen, but this is a picture of it. And this could fit on your desk in class. It could fit on any tabletop you've got. Now, there are really high-end microscopes that might take up a whole room. Uh, and can take up a whole room or even a whole floor of a building. But this one is kind of designed to be portable, uh, and it's actually very, very good for what it is. Um, it's still better than probably 
light microscopes that you're used to using. Now, uh, just to give you a sense of scale, uh, with our naked eye, we can see things down to about the 100 micrometer scale. So the, pr the smallest unit of measurement you're probably used to measuring on your own with a ruler or something is probably a millimeter. Uh, anything, the next unit down from that is micrometers. And uh, to give you a sense of how small that is, a single strand of your own hair is about 100 micrometers thick. Once we get past something smaller than a single strand of our hair, in terms of thickness, we need to use light microscopes. Using those, we can use we can look at blood cell and bacteria. And once we get down to the nanometer scale, which is one billionth of a meter, uh, we need to start using electron microscopes if we want to see anything smaller, down to viruses, DNA. And then if we use something called a transmission electron microscope, we can see glucose uh, like molecules and atoms. Philip, uh, Mr. Berry had a comment about asking about a two-story electron microscope at NC State. And I think what he's talking about is uh, one of our uh, transmission electron microscopes that you just mentioned, um, which is our um, Titan. Um, and it's it's large. If you take a tour, it's in a really cool room. And I'm going to see if I can pull, I don't know if I can pull a picture of it, but I can certainly send a link. But it's, it's a really neat microscope that um, uh, we have that can see down to the the, the individual atoms in a, yep. in a sample. Yeah, and those, those and operate, operate you know, completely. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Not, yeah, I'm bouncing not. back and forth here. And I, I, I had done a tour once and seen that. And so I had referenced that to the students when I was explaining kind of what was going to be going on too. So just wanted to kind of mention that also. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. So the, so, so the, there's two differences, so there's two differences between, between the, those, the, the, the Titan and the, the one you're going to see today. Uh, today. This one is called uh, a scanning electron, electron microscope, microscope where, where basically the sample is at the bottom of this of the microscope and the, the beam is scanning along the surface. So it's reading it like a book, uh, top to bottom, left to right. Uh, and uh, and then we're looking at the electrons that reflect off of it, essentially. In a transmission electron microscope, the sample would actually be up here where that blue strip is. And the, 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 we'd be using a much higher uh, 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 higher voltage for the beam and it, the electrons will be passing through the sample and basically the atoms in the sample present or project a shadow it's like hand puppets but with atoms the electrons are going to uh, cast a shadow from the electron beam and we can uh, see what atoms look like that way but um, that's we're using the scanning electron microscope today so we're just looking at the surface of stuff so uh, I know that uh, I did. These aren't the actual these pictures. Aren't the actual these pictures. are things that I pulled off of Google Images. But just to remind you, we have we got the tea bag with the tea in the bag. We have a stick of gum. Thank you for sending it unused. Uh, we have a shedded snake skin and pine needles. And what I want to point out is uh, you can't really put these whole items into a microscope. You could, but um, when we're doing science, we have to break things down. We have, you know, this tea bag. If you bring me the sample, it can mean a lot of different things. Do you mean the, the tea bag itself? Do you mean the, the tea leaves inside? Uh, what I and the same with pine needles. There's so many different parts. So what I did was kind of take different parts of each of these so that we can look at different uh, different parts of the sample. So and. And to, maximize to maximize not having to change the samples out too much because out, the microscope is under microscope vacuum, vacuum, I try to put a I bunch of uh, samples, samples on one of these little pucks little that you see right here. And this one's actually bigger than the one we're using today. But this is what it looks like. Um, basically, it's a little, this is, this. you can see this is the palm of my hand. This is probably bigger than a quarter, probably, at, if, I don't know if anyone has half dollars anymore, the silver dollar things, but that's about the size of one of those. And what I did was I took the tea leaves out and then I sprinkled them on to the top here and then cut out a section of the tea bag and put it here on the second row on the left this is a piece of the snake skin in the middle then I put in a piece of gum I also took the outside of the gum wrapper and then the inside of the gum wrapper here on the right and on the bottom row we have different parts of the pine needle so we have the pine needle itself we have uh, the base of it which is a lot tougher looks like wood um, I think it's called the shaft and then what I did was actually cut cross sections so I cut thin sections of it and then put the pine needle in the base uh, pointing up at us so that we could see what the inside of the pine needle looks like so we can't just put that sample into the microscope uh, and, and get a good image. Uh, we have to take one extra step. And uh, electron microscopes generate an image basically used by conducting electricity at the surface of the sample. So the way electricity works, electrons are transferring along the length of a wire. That's the same kind of concept of what's happening on the surface of these samples when we're generating an image. It's conducting electricity right at the surface. So 
If you don't know, a lot of these ions would not make good conductors. They would not be they would not be very electrically conductive. So what we do is we actually coat it with a thin layer of metal, and we use a mixture of gold and palladium, and we coat the samples and. It actually turns everything, you would think it would be like bright and shiny gold, but because of palladium, it actually turns a little bit brown. It's Philip, can I ask real quick? I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you hit present on that so the images are just a little bit bigger for everybody to see? Yeah, sure. Uh, that's yeah, awesome. Sure. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, yeah so just to recap, this was the uncoated samples, and then down here we have the puck with the, the sample holder with the samples coated, so they don't look that exciting. They just look dirty now, but trust me, this makes the imaging a lot easier. It makes the images pop a lot more, and while if you were using a really, really high powerful microscope, you might eventually be able to see that coating, like if you get up to like 50,000, 100,000 times magnification, you may start seeing the texture of that coating, but in the microscope that we're using today, uh, a 10,000 uh, times magnification or less, uh, we can't see that coating. We're still just getting a great image of the surface of the samples because the scale and size of the features is, is bigger than the actual scale and size of the film. So um, I just want to make sure you have that background because we can't just put necessarily any sample into the microscope and get a good image of it. If it was like a metal or something like stainless steel, we wouldn't have to coat it. Um, so just something to think about uh, when you, if you ever want to get into electron microscopes. Uh, you've got to you, there are ways to look at it uncoated, but generally coating them with some type of metal is going to make it a lot easier. All right, so with that said, I'm going to switch over to the microscope, and uh, I'll be going through, this is the software that helps me drive the microscope, uh, and I'll go through the different uh, buttons and stuff, but first let's just turn it on. So I'm going to press start. So it's going to turn on, it's going to apply a voltage to that filament in the top, what's called the electron gun, it's going to start boiling off electrons and everything's going to initialize and it's going to start. Uh, Philip, uh, yeah. sorry to interrupt, we have one question about how applying the coating before we get too far into the Yeah, sure. So imagine we put the sample under a hockey puck sized piece of gold or gold plating in our case. So we put the sample underneath this disc of gold and then we put it in a vacuum chamber and then we apply an ionizing gas that fills that chamber. We then turn on a, a high voltage and then that gas ionizes. It basically starts uh, bouncing molecules everywhere inside the chamber and knocking off uh, uh, molecules of gold molecules or palladium, gold, whatever it is you're coating, and it basically coating, rains basically gold rains and palladium gold, down. Palladium down. Uh, it doesn't look uh, it like doesn't rain. Look it like actually looks like a cloud of plasma. So uh, this, it's like this cloud of purple glowy stuff, and you can actually see it. Uh, if I think about it, I'll try to take a picture of that system, because uh, there's nothing more beautiful than how plasma looks. Uh, it's like this most, it's like this crazy purple color. But basically that purple cloud is the gold and palladium molecules basically raining down on uh, the whatever it is you're trying to coat. And that's a process called sputter deposition. We use that for a lot of other things in nanotechnology that I'm not going to get into today, but basically we can make it rain gold. Make sense? <laughs> that's a very simplified uh, uh, um, explanation. So the first thing we're going to look at is the tea leaves. Now, Shane, or if the person is there that gave this tea, do we know what kind of tea this is? I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna... Sorry, sorry. Yeah, so I'm asking. Ma Martha's here and in the meeting here, and she's the one that wanted to add the. There we go. Citrus. Citrus tea. Citrus tea. And, and so I'm guessing. So I'm guessing... Citrus I'm means uh, uh, it may have some black tea in it, and it may have some other like flower components or something. But. Oh. Backing up a second, you know, there's different colors of tea. I, my favorite is white tea because it's supposedly stronger, got higher ca caffeine content. But you know, there's anything from white to yellow to green to black, like oolong teas or uh, other types of teas. And then there's like flower teas. But for the actual tea leaves themselves, the color is all based on how long they allow the tea leaves to oxidize after they take it. So. Um, and so uh, what oxidizing means is basically oxygen, oxygen uh, attaching to molecules and whatever bag, uh, that is. So, gun, you know, the, uh, the most common form of oxidation snake skin. Are, would probably have learned by now is how metal rusts, like iron rust, it's exposed to oxygen 
oxygen in the air and the water and basically oxygen binds to it and it starts degrading it so it's so oxidized. Time, whatever, no worries, um, but that's the same concept with tea leaves. So the way they control that is after they pluck the tea leaf, they can lock in, uh, they allow it to oxidize and then they lock it in by heating it and so it can't oxidize anymore after they've toasted it or heated it or something so a yellow or white tea would not have been oxidized as long but the uh, black teas would have been allowed to sit for a little bit longer and oxidize more and that oxidation process can unlock different flavors uh, so basically there's these molecules called polyphenols and that's what's, what actually oxidizes through that process and for black tea leaves they actually basically crush them up and, and smash them and agitate them they like imagine putting them in a pestle and mortar or something or just you know taking something and grinding them up uh, that breaks them apart breaks them open and creates more surface area so more surface to actually come in contact with oxygen and oxidize and become darker and unlock different flavors now um, we can't what you're gonna notice is we can't actually see color this probably doesn't look like a black tea leaf to you we can zoom in a little bit more, get a little bit more uh, focus, and then let's start scanning slow. So electrons, electron microscopes, you can't see color in it. If you ever Google image an electron Im uh, microscope image, it's not going to have color. The way we see light in different colors is that white light breaks apart into uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, based on the wavelength that is being refracted. So we can't actually, or we can see color optically, but with ele electrons, they're only coming off at one wavelength, so they only have one color. Uh, so, or they only have one wavelength, so they're just either black or white, depending on how many electrons are coming off uh, at that point. So everything we're going to be looking at is grayscale today. A white leaf and a, a white tea leaf and a black tea leaf may not look totally different uh, to us because we can't see color in an electron microscope. But what I'm looking at while we're looking at this, um, so. So let's look at, let's look at this, uh, this, uh, the actual uh, software actual itself. So, so I've got my magnification got my here. Magnification so that's saying times, times 180. So this is about 200 times larger than it would appear in light uh, to us uh, in real life. Right. So, uh, so uh, and then this then little this bar little down here, you see these tick marks micro, going from where this is to this is. Right. That like distance is called a scale bar, and that distance is 300 micrometers. Right. Like, so, if I were to put a single strand of human hair right here in the image, it would take out about a third of that bar. So, it would take up kind of the right side of the screen here. Holy cow! So, these are actually very large particles. Um, uh, and uh, very large. I can believe that this is a tea leaf that's been uh, crushed and stuff because I'm starting to see what you tend to see on leaves, uh, which are stomata. So you see these little kind of holes in it. And the stomata is basically how a, a leaf uh, exchanges gas. Uh, so, you know, we know that uh, plants turn carbon dioxide into oxygen and they also can absorb water vapor through that. And those are basically their mouth. That's how they, uh, they exchange those gases and interact with the world. I also see these strands here. Those can either be ribs of, of the tea leaf or they can be actually proteins in it, um, like protein strands. But, you know, these particles are very big. You can see, let me back up to a low magnification and start scanning a little bit slower. Um, now, because we're focused on this particle right here, these smaller ones in the background might not be in focus, but... Um, you know, we're only at times 30 magnification, so it's not that big, but I, yeah, right. we're not that zoomed in. But, you know, I see a lot of different particles. There's so many different sizes. So obviously there's a big size distribution of the different tea leaves uh, in here. So I would bet in a citrus tea you have different, like, uh, petals, tea leaves, and you may even have, like, flower components in it, like, either, even, like, orange uh like zest pieces or something. So um, there's a lot we could look at here. We talked about how they treated it too with palladium um, and all that stuff. So let's move on to, I'm not gonna spend too much time on the tea bag itself, uh, but I did cut a section of it. Let's right. zoom down. A lot of the focusing and adjusting brightness, this, this microscope does a good job of doing that automatically. Uh, so all I'm doing over here is clicking autofocus, auto brightness. I'm sure you guys can do that if you, want to use it for... uh, if you came in here. It's, it's all about sample prep for this microscope. So knowing how to uh, choose where you pick your sample from, uh, how to code it using that coder, and then coming in here and just being a good scientist and describing your observation. So this is the actual piece of the uh, tea bag. I think I'm at the middle, like, or 
So on that tea bag, there's a the outer edge is sealed to keep the tea in, but the inside is a little bit more porous so that uh, the water can pass through. But the the distance between the fibers needs to be small enough that the tea leaves don't come out. Um, but maybe some small particles will. But also in a tea bag, we need the the fibers that are that make it up to be uh, to not could become loose. So they're they're what's called a continuous filament. Uh, fiber where basically that means that there's not short fibers that can come loose so they they basically blow molten plastic into fibers and then form it into these uh, pieces so we'll zoom in a little bit more and get a nice focus and then scan slow so you'll notice, um, I'm, I'm, or you may be noticing that I'm clicking between this fast and slow button. So when I'm clicking fast, the microscope is, is scanning uh, really quickly along the surface. So basically that's like speed reading. Uh, it's, so the, the beam is constantly reading the sample from top to bottom, left to right. When it's scanning fast, uh, we can't see as many details. Uh, because, But I want it to go fast so that I can see what I'm adjusting and, and see as I move along the sample, um, but when I want to see a lot of details, I'm going to read slow. I'm going to click the slow button, and then it's going to start giving me more resolution and more details of what we're looking at. And so now if we look at these fibers, uh, so this, this scale bar here is 100 micrometers across, so a single strand of human hair would cover about half the screen here. So these are very small fibers, like microfibers, and the same process that they use to make these tea bags, I can actually make nanofibers with. And in fact, you can kind of see some nanofibers uh, sticking around kind of here, but generally speaking, these are microfibers. All right. And I do have some pictures saved already um, that I will send Shane and so he can share with all of you. Um, I want to make sure we get to all of the samples, uh, and then we can come back to any uh, crowd favorites at the end of it. So now we're going to move over to the snakeskin. Uh, is there any more questions uh, while I'm focusing and uh, there's no, no more questions. I was going to mention that um, I don't know if you mentioned at the beginning when we were talking about the microscope, but we um, also can bring that microscope to different places. So if <laughs> if it would be of interest when we're allowed to come back in school and Athens drives a short distance away, we can actually bring the scope to the school for a day or two days if there are other classes that might be interesting interested. And the nice thing about that is that students can get their hands on the tools as Philip continues to mention there this microscope is really user friendly um, I can operate it so we know that <laughs> it's pretty user friendly but the autofocus really helps but um, it would be really hard to break so more likely to break in our car driving to the school yeah. then <laughs> so so I will say too um, that the AP chemistry teacher is right across the hall and I texted her as y'all were are doing this and she just came over and was just as amazed as, as I've been. I keep turning my video off because I keep leaning in so close. I don't want everybody to have to stare at my face as I'm trying to look at the images here. But um, but yeah, I, I'm like I mentioned, I'm recording this and I told her I'd share this with her. I would imagine you hear from at least one of us if y'all are really willing to come out. I think that'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. We would love to. We would love to. It's what it's designed, it's what it's designed to do. It's to been, do. It's, or we bought it just to travel around. So, um, yeah, very easy yeah, to use. I could, easy, uh, easy. Uh, even, with even with our old electron, uh, desktop, electron desktop electron microscope, uh, I've taken it to as young as like, I don't know what, four, fourth graders, third graders even. And, yeah, and, we ta we've taken it to elementary schools before um, for like science nights and we've done a couple of, fifth, we did a fifth grade, a few fifth grade classes, but it's pretty, it's really easy to use. So I'm gonna click away just for a second, uh, just so that I can point out uh, some things. So on a snakeskin, right? There's so many different, you know. Uh, you know, I think uh, one of the comments from uh, uh, who provided it, uh, they said it was a full shed. So on a, uh, on the whole skin, there's probably so many different areas that we can look at. You know, we could look at the tail, we could look at the head, the eyes, uh, the different parts. So I just cut a part from the side, kind of halfway down, because I noticed that. Uh, on the, on the kind of on the side, on the side uh, of the of the, of the, of the 
I don't know, I'm not a snake expert, but the, the actual body itself, you know, the top has like this almost mesh pattern. And then on the bottom, it's got uh, these long rows of, 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 of a pattern. So let's see if I can zoom in even more. Uh, let me back up. So, you know, on the left here, this would be the top side of the snake where my cursor is. And then on the right side of the sample, there is, uh, that would be the bottom side of the snake. So I was just interested in seeing if there was a difference between the two. So the other thing I want to point out is, you know, the snake skin is clear to us. It's translucent. We can actually see through it. I can see the uh, special tape that I'm using underneath that. Um, and I may talk about that some more, but that's what we're looking at in the SEM image right now. On the left side is the top side of the snake skin. The right side of this image is the bottom side of the snake skin. So we can see the difference in that pattern. But we can't see through it. Um, I want to point out, uh, to remember, when I said when the electron microscope is basically inducing a bit of electricity on the sample to generate an image. Um, so the, we want to try to use as many conductive uh, parts as we can when we're preparing the sample. So that's why the sample holder itself is made of aluminum. It's a great conductor. The special tape that we use on the other to, to, to hold the sample down is a, is a carbon it's called a carbon tape, and so basically it's a it's a tape that's got carbon nanotubes or nanofibers in it, and those uh, nanotubes help make it conductive. And so basically, and then the, all the parts that hold that holder onto the stage, and then the stage, everything's uh, conductive, so that there's a good conductive path of electrons through the sample. But let me back out a second, internalize what the the uh, the uh, snakeskin looks like, but let's go look at the tape. Uh, a lot of people tend to be interested in the tape sometimes. And it does look cool, but I want to show you what it looks like. And adjust the brightness. And so this is what the actual tape looks like. Uh, it almost kind of looks like a cheese or something. I hear Swiss cheese sometimes. Uh, but it looks kind of smooth, but we can see, you know, cracks in it. And that's actually from the coating. So the metal coating, uh, when it goes onto the tape and then the tape relaxes and stuff, the, the film can actually crack. So we can actually see the film itself. But the point is the tape has a lot of texture and the film underneath it can have a lot of cracks. Um, and that could be from the tape itself, but we can see the tape in the microscope. But when we go back over to snake skin, uh, or if you remember, did we see the tape underneath it? So my answer is no, I can't see the tape beyond it. So that tells me that, you know, there's a big difference between how the snakeskin is translucent optically and how we can't see through it in the electron microscope. So that tells me that it is pretty thick. Uh, the electrons can't pass through uh, this, um, this material that the snakeskin is made out of. So even though it's optically transparent, it's thick enough that the electrons can't get through it. Um, so it's not what we call uh, electron transparent, which is what we need something to be uh, if you want to look at a transmission electron microscope. But generally, like the actual clear parts look smooth. They're very smooth. So that would actually explain why they are so uh, see-through, because uh, when something is translucent, that usually means it's very smooth uh, and light can pass through it unobstructed. And so if we slow down and look at the pattern, the mesh part, the top part of the snake, we can see the pattern of its scales, but the actual you know, structure of the the parts that are see-through to us, um, you know, this part where the mouse cursor is and then the part on the right, um, that's very smooth. So that means that light can pass through it without obstruction. Whereas these parts that we can that we can't see through when we're looking at it in real life have a lot of structure to them. Light can't pass through it because there's so much shape and texture to it. Quick question. Um, is there a way to estimate how thick something is based on on this kind of idea of translucence? Uh, for an electron microscope, if you can see something beyond it, uh, that means it could be 100 or so nanometers thick or less, so really thin. But anything that you can't see through, it's hard to estimate how thick it is unless you actually cut it and look at it on its side. Um, we have to actually measure it uh, basically like you would with a ruler. So we put it on its side and then measure how thick it is. Um, 
but not by yeah. passing the main code. Oh, and I was also oh, going to mention that I think another point think of another emphasis point is, point is that we really are just, are just getting information, information, I guess, from the top yes. of the sample. Yes. So, um, so that's another that's point. Another and then point. depending on the detector, depending sometimes, the detector you sometimes, sometimes you can get some topographical, topographical information, information um, um, but, it's, but it's, it definitely, it definitely is more of a surface analysis of what you're looking at. And so I guess... Philip mentioned that Philip in some of his the way, way he prepared the samples, he did cross sections. Cross so that's sections, how you would do it, would do it um, uh, with the uh, scanning with electron the microscope. microscope. But the other kind, kind of, we have another uh, dual beam uh, SEM beam as an ion, ion beam, beam, where you could actually look at the surface, look at the surface using, using an electron beam, beam and then use the ion beam to remove material and then look at another layer and kind of continue down on the sample. But that obviously would be a little bit more intense. It might be easier just to do a cross section. So it really depends. I guess on what you're trying to find out about your sample. Yeah, so uh, we're moving on to the gum now. Uh, now, I had to be a little hesitant with the gum. I think uh, you mentioned uh, at first one of the samples you might want to send in is the uh, candle wax. Um, and, but I want to point out real quick just what the gum looks like optically. So, right, I cut out a very small section, and I'm pretty sure this is take five gum or something, and you can see like a hexagonal pattern in it going through it. Um, so, note that pattern and note the blue color. Uh, and so, we're scanning slow. Um, so, uh, uh, chewing gum is made from a mix of what's called the main ingredient is called the gum base. It's got resin, wax, and sometimes plastics like polyethylene or rubber in it, and that's what actually makes it elastic and chewy and not degrade, and, you can, and it has a bounce to it. Um, but resin and wax can kind of get uh, uh, iffy with electron microscopes. So anything oily, like think of like olive oil or something like that, like even gasoline or something. Uh, anything like that, if you put it into a microscope under a high voltage, anything oily or waxy has long chain hydrocarbons in it. And high voltage can actually break those hydrocarbon molecules apart. And when they break apart, they can come dislodged, they can reassemble on themselves. Uh, but basically, what we don't want to happen is to just put a bunch of hydrocarbons in the sample like candle wax and then make them break apart, coat all over the inside, and then keep reforming on themselves over time. Because uh, hydrocarbons are also insulating, they can basically ruin the electron optics, how the electron microscope works. Uh, and so we have to be careful so to be with careful things like that. That's why I couldn't put candle wax in the, in the uh, system because it would break down potentially under the microscope depending on you know what kind of candle it was. Um, but in gum, the gum base isn't a lot. There's a lot of other stuff in it, especially like the, you're going to uh, see like crystals, and, which are like sweeteners and flavors or artificial sweeteners, I should say. But at LOMAG, uh, we can see that pattern uh, and we can see how there's like that indention. But let's zoom in here at the tall part. Part. Um, but yeah, so even though there is wax and gum, there's not a lot, and it's kind of binded to a lot of other stuff. Uh, it can't really break free that easily, so I'm not that uh, worried about gum itself because there is a lot of flavoring in these. So let's scan slow. All right, so we're at about 150x magnification. We'll go a little bit higher in a second, but you know what this looks like looks almost like what a mineral would look like, like a rock or something, or even cement or something. So there's a lot of crystals and like really hard stuff, things that might would look like they wouldn't feel good to chew. But these are all the flavorings and artificial sweeteners that they use in it that all break down as a function of, or at, while you chew. So when, you, when you're chewing gum, the warmth of your mouth basically relaxes the elastomer, the plastic, or the waxy gum base that they're using, and it, and it allows it to get chewy. And then uh, the water and the chewing in your mouth breaks down these flavors and allows you to taste it. And so over time, you actually swallow the crystals, uh, and or they break down in your in your mouth, and then you're only left with the waxy gum base. Uh, and one thing that I learned uh, while researching this stuff, yes, I was researching gum last night, is what makes a gum harder to blow a bubble with is these crystals. And, you know, once I read that, like, it makes total sense. So if you want to blow bigger bubbles, you have to chew the gum more and more and try and be just left with that gum base. Uh, so that you can so blow a bigger bubble. Blow a bigger bubble. And, uh, and uh, I was never good at blowing bubbles, so I guess I just wasn't chewing my gum enough. 
Uh, but we're at a high magnification, like 600x, and these are, we see there's like really big particles, and then there's also really, really small ones. So I don't really know the difference between the two. They could just be smaller versions of the big ones. But um, all this stuff is for flavoring and uh, making it taste sweet. Very interesting stuff. Now we're going to go to the pine needle next. Um, I'll come back to the gum wrapper if we have a little bit more time. But the pine needle is really cool. I want to get right to it. So first thing we're going to look at is the pine needle just laying down on its side. Now, I don't know what specific pine needle uh, this comes from, and I was kind of overwhelmed when I was trying to read into this stuff last night. Uh, there's all kinds, you can basically ID the whole, uh, the pine tree just by the, the length of the pine needles, how many there are, and I think in these, uh, there's bundles of three, they're about eight inches long, uh, and they're green. So. Uh, if someone wants to go and find out which one uh, that is based on that, I, I think it's a, it is definitely a pine tree, but what specific pine tree, I don't know. But we're looking at the side of it, so, and I remember as a kid, like, the pine needles were itchy, right? And if you, like, if you, like, ran your finger across, it would kind of hurt. And I just never thought about it until you all sent me a pine needle, and I was looking at it, and it's got this serrated edge going along the side of it. And so that's why they're that's sharp. Why they're sharp. They've got these really, really hard serrated edges along the side of it. And as we look along the actual, like, uh, the middle of it, there's, like, this mountain, which there's probably serrated edges on that. So basically these these single pine needles almost have, like, a triangular shape. Uh, and then at the points of its triangle has these serrated edges, kind of like a serrated knife that you would uh, use in your kitchen. Uh, and uh, best I can tell, no one really tell, understands really exactly understand why. We know that they create them from, or people suspect that they create them from minerals, uh, but they, and that's why they're harder. But um, why they need serrated edges, nobody quite knows. Let's zoom in a little bit more and refocus and zoom out. There's there is a little goodie that I found that I want to try to find again if I can. I think it was a little bit further down. Yeah, there it is. All right, so Mod, you probably know what I'm getting at. <laughs> uh, so we're going to stop here, autofocus, and then start scanning slow. And we're scanning like kind of in the middle of it, uh, in the middle of the pine needle on its side. So we're starting to see some finer details. So I'm starting to see these rows of circles. And Best I can tell, that is what the pine needle stomata looks like. So remember I said I pointed out the stomata on the, on the tea leaf. So a pine needle is a leaf. It just looks different. Um, but it has all the basic components of a leaf, but they might just look different. So its stomata are still circular, um, and, but they look a little bit different. But it's still the way that the, ne that the leaf, or the needle in this case, interacts with gas in the atmosphere. So it can absorb carbon dioxide and, like, and, and then release oxygen out of it. That's the cause of all of your And then we also see kind of like these fine strands of things. And that can actually be proteins on the surface or just the skin uh, of it dehydrated. So a, a needle or a leaf is all how it regulates moisture and in, in the plant that it comes from. So the leaves and needles tend to be moisturized they must be, or tend to be full of water. Um, and so when we put something in an electron microscope, we have to have it under vacuum. And when we put it under vacuum, water turns into vapor and then gets sucked out. So. So when we're looking at something, we're not looking at it necessarily how it would look in an optical microscope. If you look at this in an optical microscope, it'd probably look smooth. But just to, I always use this uh, metaphor, if you wanted to look at a grape in an electron microscope, you'd end up looking at a raisin because it would be dehydrated. It would have a wrinkly texture to it, even though you know that a grape doesn't have it. So this texture may not actually be there when we're looking at it um, uh, in an optical microscope. But check out this particle right in the middle. 
scan fast again and scan Well, slow. Philip's well, talking. I'm going to just say one quick say thing one about, about um, the electron microscope electron is there are certain there electron are microscopes where you can introduce a little water um, to try to keep that that uh, the integrity of the structure. And there are also um, what are called cryo-electron microscopes where you can freeze the sample to also maintain the, the integrity so that you would get a better sense of what it looks like um, with, under without being under vacuum. Yeah. yeah, we have all kinds of we tricks we can use. Uh, Cryo SEM is Cryo a little, little bit harder, harder to, to, to use. To use. Um, I don't even know how to use one yet. I just haven't uh, had the need to learn it yet. Uh, I mostly use the dry ones. Um, so we're zooming in and we're seeing this particle right here. And it kind of looks like two little like football sized particles. And then on the other side, there's actually like a shell. So what that is, is the bane of my existence. It's pollen. So that's a couple weeks ago. And you saw yellow stuff coating all over the ground. Uh, you know, it's usually tied around spring break. Uh, you know, there's yellow dust covering everything. That's pine pollen. And this is the culprit. This is a single particle of pine pollen. And it looks different if you flip it over or look at it on its side. It has this really cool shape. Uh, we have a whole, uh, we have actually two lessons and probably, or no, one video and one thing online where we show different particles of pollen. So pollen from a pine tree will look totally different from pollen from a conifer tree, pollen from a honeysuckle plant. It all looks different, but we see pine pollen all the time here. If you want to know what it looks like under a microscope, that's what it looks like. It's not enough for me to have an allergic reaction yet. So, um, I dropped the link to that video in the chat. So last last spring, when everything was shut down, we did a program called Takeout Science, where we looked at different things every week in the electron microscope. Um, so if you're interested in that, I put the link in the chat. I know we only have a few minutes left. Uh, I'll quickly show you a side of the, uh, the shaft or the base of that pine needle. Um, it looks very tough, uh, very fibrous. Uh, there's like different fibers, there's different stuff on it. Um, it looks a little bit to us and the, you know, when we look at it in real life, it looks kind of like wood and this does look tough. So I'm just gonna let it, let it take an image and then I really wanna get to the cross section. Shane, if you need to cut us off, that's fine. Um, but I wanna at least show the cross section. Um, we have a lot of samples, uh, you know, we could quickly just take pictures, but part of science is breaking down the different samples that you find and trying to understand the different parts. So the last thing that I wanna definitely show you is the cross section of the base, that shaft that we were just looking at. So it's where the, um, the three pine needles all combine and then are locked into that, uh, little wooden uh, shaft part and we're going to start scanning slow. So remember, uh, so with a cross section, right, I took a razor blade and then I put it, put this, I cut it in half and then I put it on its side so we could see inside that shaft. So we're looking at the inside of the shaft. So what we can see is this outer rim is the actual like wooden shell kind of uh, the really tough thing, the out exterior that we were just looking at. And then inside those pine needles have to grow from somewhere, but it looks like they almost are all together uh, when they're when they're in the shaft. So we can actually see the outlines of three different pine needles. So this is one, this is one, and then this is a third one. And then each pine needle has different layers. We can almost see the cell structure of the different layers of it. So let me zoom into just this one really quick and start and scanning slow. slow. Um, so um, the so outer the exterior outer where we exterior, saw that, we that that serrated edge and we can edge, maybe kind of see it, but basically the outside of the pine needle itself is what's called the mesophyll. It's a little bit tougher. It gives the pine needle its structure. We have this inner, the, 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 the layer in the middle with all these fine, very small cells is its vascular uh, structure, the innermost layer. That's what actually transports water and resin through it. And then, uh, and then uh, there's also this there's also outer this layer, which outer helps layer with transporting uh, as, as well. Um, um, but um, this, middle this middle layer is where the chloroplast where and the chlorophyll, chlorophyll is. is. So that's what actually that's gives what actually uh, the pine needles, pine needles its green needles color. Green so we know about photo so photosynthesis, photosynthesis, right? It's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's where the chlorophyll, where the chlorophyll is, is, and that's what makes pine needles and leaves 
turn green, and the outside is actually clear, and it gives it its structure, so that's why you can see the green coming through. So I'm going to just zoom in more on the cell structure, and I want to open up to any questions. I know we're almost out of time, but I want to uh, make sure you all have time to ask questions if you have any. I will definitely send uh, some pictures to Shane so you can hang these up on your wall or refrigerator. And, and someone uh, made the comment, it looks like it looks like desktop wallpaper. And yeah. I said it yeah. does. So yeah. if you guys get the images, you can put them on your yeah. the backgrounds. Yeah. Nature is so, beautiful. <laughs> so be honest real quick. How many times have you scanned things just because you're interested and turned them into pictures for yourself? Or what's your desktop background, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah it, happens uh, it happens a lot. I don't, I don't often get a lot of time to actually like look at something uh, that you know I wanted to look at. Um, uh, but it's uh, most of the time what a company or a student or a professor wants to look at. Uh, and sometimes you see some really incredible things. My desktop background though is. Um, it's basically salt, uh, but basically they create, someone makes these desalination membranes and they, uh, so desalination means they want to take seawater, turn it into drinking water. And so they're trying to remove salt. But anyways, we, we took one of these desalination membranes and you can see these salt crystals uh, forming even on the surface of it. And it's just really beautiful because it's kind of like the, the, the forming process of the salt crystals, which if you look at salt and anesium, it, it looks crystal and it's very cubed, but the, when it forms on a surface as these really crazy geometric shapes and stuff, um, it's really, really crazy. So that's my desktop background, but um, in general, students like y'all give me the best stuff to look at. Um, I would never think to look at a pine straw uh, unless uh, you guys won a contest and told me to look at it. So all this stuff is really cool. I could put all this stuff as a background as well. So thank y'all for sending this to me. All right, I, I want to throw it out too. If there's anybody that has any other questions, I think a lot of students are just kind of in awe of what they're seeing. So, um, and that's kind of how I feel like I've been too. But if anybody has any questions, by all means, fire away with them right now. Someone asked, Someone do we have asked, time to look at individual atoms? atoms? And I wish we <laughs> could <laughs> with this yeah. microscope. Um, uh, Philip, do you want to? <laughs> expand on yeah, that yeah, yeah. so uh, just with this microscope uh, we can't even go to a magnification you can see it so I've zoomed in as far as I can this is a hundred thousand X and we can't even see actually see much at this magnification you know a lot of microscopes can send you with this microscope a lot of whatever you buy a microscope or if you're looking at shopping one whatever the maximum magnification you can actually go to you can really only actually expect to resolve something about half that so the maximum actual magnification I can zoom into on this one is 100,000x. To see individual atoms at a minimum, you need to be at at least a million to two million x magnification. So with this specific microscope, we can't do it. But more importantly, you need a sample that is, and I said this earlier, electron transparent. So for something to be electron transparent, you need special sample prep tools to basically cut fine sections of it that are like, I mean, those are called a microtome. It's like very, very fine diamond blade, which cuts something so thin that you really can't even see it even with your own eyes. You have to like uh, have something else to hold it. Uh, but it has to be 100 nanometers thin or less to actually do that. So that's a very involved process. Uh, it's it's very tedious and uh, what I did today was just very crude uh, just cut it with a razor blade put it on its side so we could look at the surface but if we wanted to look at the, the atoms in it we would have to go through a lot of more steps to make it even thinner and thinner and thinner and then see individual atoms and I'll add on to that um, you also would not need to be in the room that you're in uh, because just uh, it, you have to be in a room that's very still so we have a video that we've made where essentially basically, essentially basically changes in the temperature in the room um, can cause you know the atoms to move around so if you're trying to look at you know specific atoms and have them be very still the environment that you're looking at them in needs to be very controlled um, and then we have another uh, comment um, that from Evan that says the 3d software I use reminds me of uh, this reminds me a lot of when I render pictures out um, it can use AI based denoising for said renders and could this software Software use AI to denoise the image. Oh man! Uh, <laughs> uh, you know there. Uh, so, what noise uh, 
means can mean a lot of different things. To me, noise kind of means uh, what Maud was talking about, the vibrations in the room. So if I, if I zoom in, this is another pine particle, or pollen particle. Uh, that's not a good example. Let me uh, refocus. But um, if I zoom in really far, it's maybe hard to see, but I can see like kind of smearing. You see on this particle right here, there's like smearing going on here. So that's actually vibration in this room. I have this thing on a on a on an air table, and it's trying to help reduce vibration. Uh, and there may also be other types of noise. Uh, usually, any type of AI that's helping denoise us is something that actively cancel out uh, drift, like thermal drift of the sample, or something for vibration. Um, it would be an active thing. You would want to remove all noise before you try to collect the image. Denoising after the fact would probably be, uh, I don't know of anything that can do that. There might be, but um, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say yeah. after the fact would be harder. Um, there's some new software on our TEMs that now the name of it is escaping me, and I don't know if it uses AI. I don't know what algorithms it uses, but it helps, like we were just talking about, if you're trying to image things at the atomic scale over a long period of time, the atoms are going to move. So the, the software automatically corrects and so that it, when you're capturing the images, it accounts for some of the movement of the atoms that is occurring over the time that you're taking images of the sample. Um, and I can't remember the name of that software, but I don't, and I, but I don't know how it works off the top of my head. Yeah. A lot of what we depend on is like proprietary software. So, you know, software, even if, it, if there is something like that, would probably cost tens of thousands of dollars. So sometimes it's about as expensive as an instrument itself just to have the software. We're looking at another fine pollen particle, by the way. <laughs> Well, y'all, and I mean, not, uh, I hate to cut you off at all because this has been awesome, but we are, we're almost 10 past. So um, I, I want to say thank you for the time, for sure. This has been incredible. And um, and since you offered, you can guarantee that I will be in touch about uh, bringing some, you know, some hardware out here and doing something like that. I think that that's fantastic as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's hard to get any kind of, I was going to say, I, we got a couple claps here in class. It's hard to get any kind of round of applause when we've got so many people virtual. But y'all, thank you so much for, for spending the time to do this, for preparing the samples and for doing all that kind of stuff. This has been really cool. Yeah, you're absolutely welcome. Congratulations on winning that contest. Y'all did. Y'all must have done a great job. <laughs> yeah. Uh, th again, thank you so much. And we will certainly be in touch um, going forward. You can bet on that. Awesome. Sounds have great. A good day. All right. Yep. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. You're welcome. Bye.